Today, our topic of discussion is on the sources of ancient Indian history. Now let us look at some of the specificities of engaging into the study of the past and the role of the sources. Preliterate past in different pockets of India continued even when written records came into existence. So the importance of this preliterate past is very significant and the preliterate past is best brought to light and explained to us by professional archaeologists. Now the archaeologists with the help of anthropologists, particularly physical anthropologists, can give us some partial knowledge of how human beings actually evolved to modern man understood by a very meticulous careful study of the remains of human skeletons which are dated to a very remote past by complex uh, scientific uh, tests. Even where human skeletal remains of very remote past are not available, archaeologists can indicate the presence of human beings by studying the most rudimentary tools of the most ancient times because such tools are, were fashioned only by human beings. Obviously the earliest tools were merely ad hoc tools fashioned out of stones, boulders or even a branch of a tree. Later stone implements began to be fashioned in a particular type or types. The transformation from what the archaeologists would talk as core stone tools to flake stone tools speaks of the slow, very slow passage from the relatively older Paleolithic times to a more advanced Mesolithic and Neolithic times. How this can be done with archaeological materials, field archaeological materials, we can illustrate with the case study of a particular archaeological site, Bagor in Bhilwara district in Rajasthan. Bagor is a Mesolithic site, that is, it belongs to the Middle Stone Age very well and thoroughly excavated by the Deccan College uh, archaeologists in Pune. The site reveals to us how the earliest uh, people in Bagor were essentially hunters and gatherers because a very large number of animal bones found from that site belong to the category of wild elements and there were clear injury marks on these bones indicating these were hunted animals. In the later part of the history of Bagor, we find that the animal bones were essentially of domesticated animals, not hunted wild animals. More dependence on domestication of animals led to a gradual uh, reduction of their earlier practice of hunting. Hunting was not given up. That's why V. N. Mishra, the excavator, called it the mixed economy. People began to live at a particular place for a longer period of time, unlike the hunter-gatherers who were essentially nomadic people. So. At this site were also found, along with the remains of the cattle pen, remains of huts 
or dwelling houses made of not permanent materials but imperish perishable materials only the post holes are there but that is enough indication that people had chosen preferred to live for a long time at a particular spot rather than remaining uh, nomadic groups or constantly mobile groups archaeologists also takes a very close look at pottery now the first potteries were indeed handmade often used the baskets as mold but then the the transformation from handmade to wheel turn pottery is a statement on very major technological step forward the different types of pottery the color of the pottery the particular design and motif painted on the pottery speaks of different archaeological cultures similarly the use of metal technology first copper bronze and later iron found in archaeological context speaks in volumes of the enormous transformation people underwent with the introduction of metal a far greater technological advance these are the indexes how the archaeologists would indicate the gradual change in the way of life of past human communities similarly archaeologist pays a great attention if and where available to the burials if a large number of burials are available the skeletal remains can be tested to indicate the age of death of this persons if found on a large number of such skeletons one can in fact suggest the life expectancy of those people at a very remote period in many burials skeletons were interred along with what is called grave goods various types of objects often of ritual significance pottery uh, other uh, metal implements sometimes very precious or semi precious stones gems were interred the use or elaborate use of grave goods is usually taken as a marker of the beginning of social differentiation from a relatively simpler social life as we know the entire history of the harappan civilization the first urban society in the subcontinent is entirely dependent on archaeological material because so far the script used by the harappans is yet to be deciphered what is interesting how the archaeologist views change the terms for understanding harappan civilization about 30 years ago were often said pre harappan harappan post harappan indicating that pre harappan and post harappan cultures were sharply different from the harappan civilization itself indicating thereby the harappan civilization did not grow out of the existing indigenous condition now with the much greater availability of archaeological material with highly sophisticated analytical tools archaeologists for the same period would use the classification early harappan mature harappan late harappan indicating that the process of the very complex process of an urban society urban culture the complexity of what is called civilization is not a sudden arrival it has a slow evolutionary process from the early to mature and then even when harappan civilization declined the cities broke up certain cultural traits percolated continued to lead to a different formation that's why the term late harappan the archaeological scenario for indian subcontinent is very complex take for example when the harappan civilization was in its full bloom it of course witnessed a very complex large scale 
expansive urban society. The rest of the subcontinent did not experience so complex urban culture and society. There is no single arrow line of the story of urban development in India contemporary to the time of the Harappan civilization, which the archaeologists make available to us, explain to us and make it intelligible to us that there were different cultural traditions. The arena of very specific specialized archaeologists who usually works with archaeochemist, paleobotanist, zoologist, geographers, geologists. It's a team effort and extremely careful excavations are needed because excavation actually means destruction of the evidence of the past. So that unearthing of archaeological objects requires extremely careful recording including photographic documentation of its original state of lying in the context of other archaeological objects and the recording of its layer, the dating of that particular layer in terms of other associated objects and documentation of that. So it's a very precise and highly technical uh, exercise which is best left to the world of professional archaeologists. I should also point out that field archaeology is definitely relevant for the study of the pre-literate phase but its use is not merely limited to the pre-literate phase. Even where we have written documents and textual information, field archaeological sources are of immense value. Let us now briefly pass on to the scenario of politics. In ancient India, political scenario is in fact the most apparent part, most visible. One of the great authors of ancient Indian political history, H.C. Rai Choudhury, in his famous political history of ancient India, lamented that India did not produce a Herodotus or Thucydides to keep to hand over to the later generations political annals, court chronicles, and therefore understanding political history of ancient India is always fraught with enormous difficulties. Yet, without political history, understanding of the chronology remains vague to us. It definitely involves the story of dynasties, how one dynasty succeeds another, but it also involves the accounts of great political personalities. The political successes, mostly in the form of wars, definitely forms a part of political history, but also the beginning, formation, expansion and then perhaps contraction or demise of a political power is also a very major subject matter of political history. What is the earliest important political uh, event known to us? Perhaps one has to look for the understanding of the earliest known important political event in ancient times to the Rig Veda that describes the victory of Raja Sudas over his ten adversaries who formed some sort of a confederacy against him on the banks of river Parushni that is present day the Ravi of the Punjab. This is described in the Rig Veda in several places very interestingly, the Rig Veda is not a text on political history. The context was something else. But in the context, the seers of the Rig Veda, the composers of the Rig Veda hymns, even when they were essentially engaged 
in religious themes could not get away from an important political event and therefore referred to this very important uh, war. Perhaps from this tendency to write even partially about important political events took the shape of what is called by Ramila Thapar the Itihasa Purana tradition. Description in the Puranas, what is called the list of genealogies and the Itihasa Purana section is essentially a pseudo prophecy on the basis of which F. E. Parjeter once tried to reconstruct at least the dynastic history called the dynasties of the Kali age. In that list, one encounters different well-known political personalities like the Mauryan rule, like the Shunga rulers, the Satavahanas or the Andhra Vrityas, Andhra rulers, they are mentioned. But the Puranas, first of all, these are very difficult to date. The Puranas also do not give the uniform list of rulers. Say, different Puranas speak of different numbers of rulers of the same dynasty. So the Puranic tradition, though valuable, is of course not at all complete. It needs to be checked and verified with other kinds of sources. That's why H.C. Rai Choudhury, while writing political history of ancient India, preferred the sources called the Pali canonical texts. The Buddha himself is a historical figure, unlike the rishis of the Rig Veda. And a number of important political personalities were contemporary to the Buddha, like Bimbisara, like Ajata Shatru, like Prasanajit of Koshala region, like Chandya Pradhata of Avanta region, Pushkara Sarin of Gandhara region. And when Pushkara Sarin of Gandhara, that is the northwestern frontier region around present day Taxila of Alpindi Peshawar, was ruling, at that time the Achaemenid ruler from Persia, Darius I, conquered some parts of the northwestern borderlands of frontier areas of India and came right up to the lower Indus Valley. This we know from a completely different variety of sources, that is the inscriptions of Darius in Iranian language and Herodotus, the father of history, wrote a little bit on the conquest of the northwestern frontier of India and also the Achaemenid rule over the Indus Basin and the lower Indus Valley. Now these are more concrete information than what we encounter about early dynasties in the Puranas. So that's why Rai Chaudhuri preferred Buddhist texts. With the coming of the Mauryas, then we stand on much firmer grounds because we have for the first time purely contemporary evidence the inscriptions of Ashok who talks about himself, his policy in first person addressing directly to his subjects or to his administrators. With that we also have for the study of the political history of the Mauryas the evidence of the Greek and Latin writers known as Alexander's historians, those historians who came with Alexander or wrote about Alexander's uh, invasion of India. They speak of the end of the Nanda dynasty and the gradual rise of Chandragupta Maurya as the founder of the dynasty. So combining the Greek and Latin texts evidence with Ashoka's inscription, one can get a reliable account of the foundation growth of the Magadhan empire of the Mauryas. The contemporaneity of a source is very crucial. With Ashoka's inscriptions begin the India's epigraphic traditions. Now we are flooded particularly for understanding of political history, various types of inscriptions, particularly the eulogies, prashastis. There are rulers who are only known to us through such prashastis, 
like Karavela, known only from his inscription. Samudra Gupta, the great uh, Gupta conqueror, is known largely from his two inscriptions, including the famous Elavat Prashasti. But understanding a ruler, however, a great ruler, through the Prashastis or eulogistic inscription, there is a problem because in many cases, such Prashastis are meant to deliberately glorify a particular ruler and sometimes there are problems in taking the inscriptional evidence of this Prashastis on face value. Let us use one such test case. In 7th century, the very powerful North Indian ruler Harshavardhana came into conflict with a very powerful adversary in the Deccan, Pulakeshin II. Pulakeshin did defeat Harshavardhana. This is recorded not only in the famous Prashasti of Pulakeshin in Sanskrit, but also mentioned by a contemporary of Harshavardhana and Pulakeshin, the very famous Chinese pilgrim, Shuansang. So, at least we get two evidence of the results of the battle between two great political uh, personalities. Harshavardhan was defeated by Pulakeshin. But Pulakeshin's court poet eulogistically stated that Pulakeshin defeated Harshavardhan, the lord of the entire North India, that is, entire Uttarapata. The kind of evidence we have regarding Harshavardhana's control of territory hardly suggests that he was the master of the whole of North India. Then why Pulakeshi's court poet stated in such a glorified term about a rival? This was done to in fact glorify his own patron that is Pulakeshin II. If the rival of Pulakeshin is shown in a blown up manner, then actually the description heightens the glory of his patron that is Pulakeshin II. So here, not only we look at the sources, but look at the sources with criticality. The other points in using inscriptions for political history is that first the inscriptions are dated, dated or datable. They use some kind of regnal reckoning, either in terms of regnal years of the ruler or in terms of some well-known eras like Shako era, identified with 78 of our common era or Vikramasambat, that is uh, starting from 57 BCE. So, if these eras are indicated, one can easily convert them into the common era and fix the chronological position. The use of a particular era is indicative of a political process. Take for example, say from uh, 440 for nearly about a century, northern part of Bengal was definitely in the occupation of the imperial Gupta rulers because the inscriptions found from here usually give the date in Gupta era, Gupta Sambat. After 550, we come across some rulers in the eastern part of the Bengal Delta, present day Dhaka, Vikrampur, Faridpur region, who suddenly stop using the well-established Gupta era of 320 uh, CE. Instead, they began to issue their inscriptions in their own regnal years. So, by refusing to use the Gupta era and preferring instead the use of their own regnal years, this is the marker of their independent sovereign political position. Inscriptions, particularly the distribution of the fine spots of the inscription on a map, is a major indicator of the territorial extent of a dynasty or a ruler or particularly an empire. The best index is that of the, uh, uh, ex the determination of the extent of Ashoka's empire. Similarly, when a land grant is issued 
by a ruler. Take for example, in 960-59, a Rashtrakuta ruler of Maharashtra region issued a land grant from Arkot district of present Tamil Nadu. But the land was actually granted in Satara district in Maharashtra. What does it indicate? It indicates that this ruler, Krishna the third, a very powerful ruler, was in fact successful in conquering a part of Tamil Nadu, Arkot area, by defeating the Cholas and he was in firm occupation of that conquered territory. He therefore had his headquarters in the heartland of the Tamil territory, yet he was issuing a grant of land in the primary stronghold of his power base that is in Maharashtra, indicating that perhaps the entire region from Maharashtra to northern part of Tamil Nadu came under his position. This is how even the relatively the half stated sentences in an inscription can enlighten us upon the political fortunes. Sometimes political history is also enlightened by the use of coins. In fact, issuing the coins becomes the marker of the independent sovereign political existence of a ruler. Take for example, in the first century AD Deccan, the Satavahana ruler Gautamiputra Satakarni had a resounding victory over his arch rival, the Shaka ruler Nahopana. This is mentioned in his inscription, an inscription like a prashasti. A classic confirmation comes in the form of a coin hoard from Nasik area, the Jogal Thembi coin, in which we find thousands of coins originally issued by Nahopana with his name and his uh, portrait on it, which were overstruck or restruck by the name, symbol, and the motives of Gautami Putra Satakarni. This could only happen if Gautami Putra Satakarni defeated the Shaka adversary. This is how story of political events can be reconstructed by using inscriptions or coins. We can look at these problems more closely of the use of sources in the subsequent discussions.